chose this drug just because it has a zero withdrawal time. We had a fairly limited hold time after our surgeries. We exhibited quite a few issues of keeping fish alive in captivity. Um, some folks seemed to do it well, we failed miserably. So we, we tried to, to stick them with the tag and get them back out as quick as we could. And the idea of the project was we were gonna stock 10 fish at each one of these three tributaries every quarter. And we were gonna stock them approximately two and a half kilometers upstream from the white within that tributary. So we actually have two forms of data collection. We have manual tracking, where we're physically going out, we're driving around the boat, we're listening, we're trying to get on top of them as, as close as we can. Sometimes, depending on what boat we have or depth of water, we can't always get to them. The woods get too thick or the brush gets too thick when they're in backwater and we just can't access them. But we're getting as close as we can. But we're doing this on a two week interval. So what we're characterizing is a winter period. We did from uh, January through the first of March, or the beginning of March rather. And then we just stocked some fish that on May 31st, we only have about a month of data that we're characterizing for the summer portion. We also have telemetry receivers. Now these are the R4000S's by ATS. We've got them in a toolbox with a deep cycle battery mounted 20 foot up in a tree. And so it's, uh, we're also swapping out deep cycle batteries every two weeks um, just to make sure that we don't lose that power and don't miss data. It's also pretty convenient to download that data and, and kind of give us an idea of, of what fish may have gone past those systems. And then the idea is that we merge these two data sets together. So we have known locations from our manual telemetry, and then we also have what I'm gonna call theoretical locations that we hear them on the boxes. Put these two together and get an idea of, of some movement patterns. So I wanna back up and just briefly describe these systems, because it's kind of a complex setup. We have stationary receivers, there's four of them at each location. Now this is a pretty um, indicative what we have our confluence boxes. And so you can see at the confluence of the river, you've got three Yagi antennas. They're unidirectional and one points down the river, one points up the White River, and the third one actually faces up the tributary. So the concept is, is as these fish approach, if they make the decision to come to the river, we can understand what decisions they're making. Are they choosing to go upstream or downstream, or are they just pushing back into the tributary? We also have three other boxes that are kind of on the perimeter. And so we've got a omnidirectional uh, dipole antenna that is five kilometers up the white, five kilometers down the white, and five kilometers up the tributary. So we're stalking them at two and a half kilometers, and so basically we can keep track of whichever direction they go. This has really been pretty helpful as far as maintaining our knowledge of which direction they went. Uh, when you go to manual track, we've got miles of river, and, and you get a lot of flooded terrestrial habitat, and, and knowing which direction some of these fish went has saved us a lot of time uh, and just running the river. So of course, anytime you set up to do a project, you, know, you, you, you always wonder how things are gonna go, and we kind of hoped to, to see a, some sort of a flood so we could kind of understand what they would do. Unfortunately, we had a massive flood. Um, so towards the end of February, the water spiked. As you can see, why we have to mount these boxes in trees. Um, some of these boxes, you know, it's a 150 yard walk when the river's dead out low, and now we're boating, strapping the boat to the tree to actually swap batteries going up and down with a climbing stand. As I mentioned, it'd be kind of interesting to, to know some of these patterns. Where the green arrow is, is actually my lowest box on the entire project, so furthest downstream. So we'd assume any flood, if anything flushed, we would pick it up. But you can see the actual stream channel itself is only 0.2 kilometers wide. At a decent flood, the bottomland hardwoods could potentially be over seven kilometers wide. So there's a, a lot of opportunity to, for those fish to get out in the woods and we know for the most part they seem to prefer that shallow peripheral habitat anyway. So it would have been very easy for them to skirt these boxes. We, we lost a lot of our fish. So, so far we've actually stocked a handful of fish uh, towards the end of December last year. Unfortunately, we did not get 10. We only had eight per site due to some unforeseen issues. And we lost, or the last time I heard of them was on March 7th, and we lost them after that. I have since flown that river a couple hundred miles trying to find them only heard three, and I haven't had time to actually go back and ground truth and find them yet, but I hopefully intend to do that here in the near future. Stock some then at the end of May, we were able to do 10 per site. As I mentioned, we were hoping to do 30 per quarter, but we did, the spring time did not work out for us, so we just kind of punted and, and, and done the summer fish. And we've, uh, the last time we went and found those was on July 3rd. 
So we went ahead and we looked at minimum daily movement. We looked at by tributary as well as by season. So as you can tell, the fish seem to be more active in the summertime than the wintertime. So that's pretty obvious. Uh, we know a lot about snakeheads and that they're fairly dormant in the wintertime, didn't express a lot of movement. We ran a repeated measures in NOVA just and using the, the individual fish as the control to kind of test the significance of this. And it did seem that the season, the movement between seasons was significant, but the difference in tributaries was not significant. We also wanted to look at maximum movement. And so we took the top three furthest traveled fish in each season and we graphed them um, by total distance traveled. And you can see three uh, of these fish in the summertime actually went more than 10 kilometers. Now, keep in mind that's basically a month worth of data. Then you have the winter fish. They have not moved, they did not move near as much and so and that was about two and a half months. So there's a good potential that these summer fish, if they continue their pattern, could move you know, two, to two or three times what, they're currently, uh, what we've currently seen. It is interesting to note, though, we're talking about maximum movements. Those three fish in the wintertime are three that I lost. So obviously, they've exited our, our listening area for the telemetry receivers. So they've obviously traveled a lot further than that. We just weren't able to document it. We also broke our movement type up into a couple of categories. One of them is directional movement. So if a fish chose to go the same direction, either upstream or downstream, three consecutive tracking events, we described it as directional movement. And you can see that almost all of those fish that exhibited directional behavior went upstream. We also have non-directional movement. That's kind of more of the random pattern, um, not any consistent direction. But you can see about half those fish kind of shifted upstream within the, the system. A little less than half moved downstream in this random pattern. And then we have this group of fish that was sedentary. And you stalk them, and they make one run after you stalk them, and they basically hold still. We were characterizing that sedentary by less than 0.25 kilometers between tracking periods. And then there were some fish that we just flat lost. Stalked them in the river, went back two weeks later, and we have no idea where they went. So I want to actually draw this out because it's kind of exciting. We can actually see some of the movements, and these are our theoretical movements. This is fish 433, traveled a total distance of 11 kilometers. So what's really interesting is we stalked it here on May 31st. I heard it on June, fir June 1st, and then I found it again on June 15th. So based on this, we would have assumed it went downstream a little bit and then chose to go upstream. However, we actually heard it on our telemetry boxes. So we know that it went all the way to the White River and then consciously made the decision to go back upstream within the tributary. And so we heard it June 3rd as well as June 11th at our confluence box in our upstream the tributary box before we found it in the manual tracking. So this boss, these systems are actually working now. We've, we've had to do some tweaking but now we're actually able to show some movement by not being there, um, which is pretty interesting. Another fish, um, this is a pretty indicative of the, of the directional movement. We stalked it, and it's gone over 10 kilometers, and it's going upstream, and it has not stopped. Every time we find it, it just keeps bumping further and further upstream. And this is kind of a fish that we're characterizing more of, of that non-directional pattern. Every time we found it, it was in a different backwater traveled about four kilometers, but it exhibited three different backwaters each time that we located it. So we also broke all the habitat down into a rubric that had eight different types. We weren't trying to get real picky about it. We just kind of wanted to make some observations about the habitat that we saw them in. So you can see in the wintertime, 78% of what they were using was stream channel habitat. A chunk of it was oxbow lakes, and a very small percentage was backwater. Now I do need to go ahead and make this statement that the water was very, very low this fall and, and carried on to in the winter time until we had that massive flood towards the end of February. So for the most part, the stream channel habitat was actually the only habitat available. Um, one of our systems has some connected oxbow lakes and a few of those have some little backwater areas in them and that's where those fish came from. Now you're gonna see a big shift here as we changed to the summertime. As I mentioned, we had a flood, pretty good one. In fact, we're still carrying a lot of that water. So 84% of the fish were found in backwaters, 4% in stream channel, and of those stream channel fish, my observation was the next time I found them, they were in a the backwater. They were just using that to travel. I happened just to catch them in, in midstream travel. 
A few of them were using oxbows, but most of these were backwaters off the oxbows that they were using. And then we did have some flooded terrestrial habitat, which we characterized as being in the woods where the water was above bank full. So, so far, we're trying to put together, as I mentioned, this invasion characteristics to, to help and explain their movements as we're talking to our, our neighbors. Summer movement appears so far that they are making the decisions to move upstream. The wintertime flood, maybe that's our potential for downstream movement. This was the only time in a tracking event so far that we've actually seen them enter the White River. But I also have to put in the caveat that we actually lost all those fish. So we don't know if they continue downstream. We don't know if that pulse of water sent them upstream like the Potomac fish seem to do when they get a pulse of the water. We really don't know what happened to those fish. And then of course, just the, the fact that habitat varies by availability. So I wish I could say that they prefer stream channel in the winter and they prefer backwater in the summer, but since those weren't really available proportionately, we can't really make those assumptions. And with that, I'll take any questions. Right, and so uh, and the question was, why do we sp um, pick summer and winter? We, we did intend to do spring, and we actually captured those fish two different times, and we lost them uh, due to captivity mortality. Uh, we got bacterial infections on one time, and we did not feel comfortable tagging them, and they all died. Uh, the second time was actually during uh, part of my age and growth and diet evaluation, and we had a batch of fish that we had set off to the side to put tags had some bad water quality in the city where they were putting like three or four times the amount of chlorine in the water and I was running it through a filter and it wasn't taking it out um, and we ended up losing those fish. So this was basically the next opportunity we could get fish ended up being towards the end of May. And I really hate that we missed that springtime because um, that would have been really interesting to see that. Yes, we're trying to get them from the same system, same area if we can. Um, we've got the original, we call Ground Zero on the Bonner Farm. That last time around, basically went in and there's about a 15 or 20 inch relift pump and you kick the relift on and an hour later you go back and you hop down to waist deep mud and just net them out of the trickle of water. Um, that seems to be how we're trying to get them. It's, it's the easiest way for us to get them, but we're getting them consistently there. Yeah. It's a good possibility and we definitely had considered that going into, but we just did not have any other way to, to, to consistently get the fish. And so that was the idea too, is that at least if we get them all from the same water body, hopefully very close to each other, that maybe they'll exhibit the same behavior proportionally. I mean, is, is that not the perfect study for a graduate student, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, all right, well, I think hopefully now, um, you had a good crowd, so it worked out well. Other folks are coming in. There's plenty of seats, front, center. Don't be shy. Woo -hoo. Mr. Chaconis, lovely to see you this morning. Uh, just a couple quick announcements. People that do have posters here, if during the break, at some point, if you want your poster, please grab it. If you don't, that's okay too. We'll find something to do with it. Thank you very much for bringing those. We are gonna try to do the group photo. Yvonne, does that work for you after the session, before our break? Our break's at 9.50, so do the break, uh, we'll do a group, group photo up here just before that. Uh, so I guess I'm moderator here for you all for, for this first and final session of the day. Um, and, and we have some of a eclectic uh, few talks here. What I try to do toward the back end with Don Orth coming up later to sort of transition us into the panel discussion, but I, I wanted to have some of the uh, presentations from places where maybe snakeheads have been established for the longest. And so we'll be hearing about Hawaii and we'll be hearing about Japan here shortly. Um, but for lack of anything better to say, Alan, I didn't have anywhere good to stick your talk. 
<laughs> uh, but I really appreciate, and, and I did kind of, uh, c yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I twisted your arm a little bit to get you here, but thank you very much for putting that together. I think it's important stuff that y'all have been working on, and, um, you know, we tried to group things according to subject matter, but it wasn't always perfect, and, and not everything matched up 100% of the time. So be that as it may, I think uh, we're still in for, for some, uh, some good information from, from Alan. So. Oh, man. yeah, thanks, Don. See, I, I wrote notes on the, so, and then, yeah. um, so what I'll be doing, uh, I'll just start at one end, if y'all can just, while, while Alan's talking, we can pass these, and, and while you're thinking or listening or dozing off, whatever the case is, jot down, if you have any questions to bring up during the panel discussion, no, I meant during all the talks, not just your oh, talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. So, you can pass these over and pass them, I'll, I'll send a couple on each side of the room. Thanks, Don. Thanks, John, I think. Okay, uh, the purpose of this talk is to uh, make recommendations for electrical settings so that you can improve sampling for snakehead. And also, more importantly, uh, possibly more importantly, the process we got to be used to get there. So, uh, and for those of you that are out um, sampling snakehead, your input to this whole uh, process is important, your experiences. Okay, so electric fishing is used for a lot of purposes uh, in snakehead work, but uh, low and, and especially variable capture probability can be a problem. It can hinder the usefulness of electric fishing. So, for example, uh, boat electric fishing on Huntington Creek for three seasons averaged, by my calculations, about 7%, and Josh did better uh, analysis, and, and more like about 2%. That's not necessarily unusual. So uh, what are the efficiency factors that affect uh, your sampling uh, goodness? And certainly there's a long list. Vegetation density is one, depth of the water, water conductivity, turbidity, electrical outputs, uh, and others. So uh, the goal of this study was to get to uh, those, some of those efficiency factors by identifying electrical outputs that may improve the capture efficiency and the precision of electric fishing for snakeheads. And this information can be used to form standardization protocols, and this project had both lab and field uh, components to it. So um, for the lab objectives, uh, we were wanting to determine the characteristics of electrical waveforms causing these, what we call capture-prone responses, and that, that means taxes or attraction to the anode or immobilization. We were looking at something called a capture-prone response threshold, and those are volts per centimeter. It's called voltage gradient, though that's a field measure of electrical intensity. And then also, what's the effective conductivity of northern snakehead? And we can use that information to fine tune these standardization tables, these output goal tables. So in, in the field, what, we, what our objectives were to uh, map the electric field of an electric fishing boat, two boom electric fishing boat, to estimate the threshold volts, current, and power output for successful electric fishing to estimate the size of the effective electrical field, what's the effective field size, and then um, evaluate the relative uh, success of three different waveforms, two pulse direct current waveforms and one alternating current waveform. Um, so what's the outcomes of all this? And, and that is we wanna make uh, recommendations for electrical waveforms, type, direct current, pulse direct current, AC, frequency, duty cycle, and then also the output voltage, current, and power that you need so we can build these standardization tables. And these, can, these standardization tables can be used to guide your settings, basically. What settings do I use? Where do I put the dial on, on the boat? And so, <coughs> so for the lab methods, basically we had a, a tank filled with water with electrodes on each end covering the cross-sectional area of the water. Um, the, the, the test tank was powered by an infinity control box run out of the wall with an isolation transformer. Don't do this at home. 
<coughs> and uh, then also a scope meter uh, that gave us not that also let us verify the output readings we we're getting on the infinity control box, but also gave us a picture of the uh, waveform. And that's what the experimental situation looked like with the scope meter, the infinity control box, <coughs> and the uh, test tank. So the treatment levels, we looked at eight different waveforms for their ability to cause attraction or taxes. For mobilization, we, we uh, had a frequency test. We went from 30 pulses per second to 120, and a duty cycle test, which is percent time on from 15 percent duty cycle to uh, 50 percent duty cycle. Oh, okay, here's the general procedure. So you select a treatment. You measure the ambient water conductivity in the tank. You place a single snakehead in the test tank. Um, you apply electrical power at some intensity over three seconds. And you note reactions and the uh, voltage gradient. If you don't have uh, that catcher prone response, then we would repeat the procedure with increased intensity to, to where we got that, that uh, th capture prone response we're looking for, or three or four times, and then we chuck the fish and uh, use another one. We didn't want to wear it out too much. And so uh, anyway, typically the sample size was three fish per um, waveform treatment. So here's a video I'll show you uh, if you guys would uh, start that. <coughs> okay, so I'm talking to the guy on the smart end, Josh. He's running the Going to 52. Uh, oh, electrical, uh, the, the uh, infinity control box. There's a snake in the tank. There's an anode to the right. To the left is the uh, cathode. And so we try to position the snake. This is a mobilization response. Okay. And there it is. Oh, so that's a mobilization response. We know what the applied voltage is in the, in the voltage gradient. Mobilization you see at 54. Coming out of the fish coming out of the snake head, and they sink. And so that's a reaction. So when you see that, you really want to get a tax response if possible to that. Okay, here's another video where we're looking at taxes. Now we wanted to get this fish facing so the cathode, is which is to the left, and that way, if it was really showing taxes, yeah. it would have to turn Three around seconds. and go back to the right to the anode. Right. So right now, try to position the fish to where it's facing the go. cathode. Now there we go, turns around, oh, and okay. going to the anode. So that's a good tax like response. Tax. That's yeah. what we're looking for. Okay. So in the field, the methods were to field map both voltage gradients along a lateral vector there, and that's what's happening here from the center of the anode out. Um, and so our, our field methods were that we wanted to do both electrofishing, testing waveforms that we found in the lab were effic had efficacy for capturing snakehead. So we were determining threshold votes, amps, and power for two waveforms. We determined the Votes, amps, and power that are used for traditional sampling uh, by, by Josh. And um, we, we also wanted to look where are those uh, mobilization and taxes thresholds in the field so we can get an idea of effective field size. We use that for standardizing field size. And then once we get these thresholds, once we know what we need to output, uh, then for each waveform to be successful, then we tested, th we compared those three waveforms by catch per unit effort to see uh, who was the winner. So anyway, this is what we get to. That we want to build these output goal standardization tables. And this is a, a look at one. Basically, in the left-hand column, it's just conductivity. That's site conductivity. You measure the conductivity. Say it's 175. And you go, OK, what's the voltage I should put on? Uh, by my eyes, looks like about 292 or something like that, you know, or what's the current you want. So it guides your outputs by conductivity. That's what we're, that's what we're after. Okay, background concepts real quick. Threshold, I've been mentioning that word, that's the minimum electrical intensity you need to get a response. A threshold, that's a minimum for taxes, a minimum for mobilization. The waveforms that have the lowest thresholds are the most efficient for a given response. They need the least power to do the same thing, the most efficient. Um, electric fields and boats, they're, apply, they're, a, they're a function of applied voltage and are described in terms of voltage gradients, volts per centimeter. And the power transfer model is what we use to build these tables by Larry Cole. That's what builds these tables. Okay. So here's results, finally. So 
We got, um, we, we looked at eight waveforms, three of them showed strong attraction responses, continuous DC, pulse DC, 30 pulse per second, 24% duty cycle, and we also saw it on 120 pulses per second, 28% duty cycle. So now, and there's a caveat on that last one. You see that little asterisk? That, what, what, what that is is that the, the immobilization or the, the uh, taxes threshold is so close to the immobilization threshold that in the field you'll never see that taxes. If it starts moving, it goes to immobilization. You'll never see it with 120 pulses per second, but you will with these other two. So these are what the other two look like. DC on the left, it's just a straight line, continuous direct current. On the right, there's a 30 pulse per second, 24% due cycle, square wave, square wave, not round wave, square wave, note that. Okay, so here's a uh, immobilization test for frequency. Basically what this is saying is, is that 60 pulses per second to 120 pulses per second fish the same, the most efficient. You need more power with uh, 30 pulses per second. So that's frequency test. The duty cycle test is saying that basically from about 25% to 40% duty fishes about the same. Sweet spots around, tw uh, well, 20 to 40%. Sweet spot about 25% duty to 40, like that. Okay, like that. Okay, then what we did was we took a 120 pulse per second, 30% duty cycle, and tested it against fish length just to, sit, to be able to derive a prediction equation of mobilization. Um, there we go. And so here's the, here's the deal. So on the x-axis is fish length, total length, and on the y-axis is voltage gradient, and those are thresholds plotted. And you see larger fish need less voltage gradient to get a mobilization response. We fit a curve, and so there we can, we can predict what the mobilization threshold is given, um, given fish size from by that. We also looked at AC waveforms. We looked at a, a symmetrical AC on the left and a asymmetrical AC on the right. Now, they're both very extremely low duty cycle, 4.8% to maybe about 2% duty. What that t tells you, what that helps you is it reduces in, uh, loading on the equipment. You can use this in higher conductivity and not load your equipment as much. But the one on the right is called AC nerve now by MLES on their backpacks, and it's like an EKG. You know, it's just a little negative excursion down there. Um, and it's a mostly a positive excursion with a little negative versus the other one that's symmetrical, all right? So we plotted those in the same way, uh, fish length on the, on the X, voltage gradient on the Y, and basically you can see that both the AC nerve, the asymmetrical and symmetrical AC, um, react or about the same. They're about either one worked out, but it's really low duty cycle, which is nice. Okay, so here's a mobilization thresholds uh, for several waveforms. And two things I want to note. The first one, the DC, do you notice that's the highest threshold? What that means is in the field, you're going to have the largest distance between immobil uh, taxes threshold and mobilization threshold. So you've got a big zone out there to get taxes. That's what that, that's what that, and the, uh, the other uh, thresholds in there, they're about, I will say they're about the same as largemouth bass. About the same as largemouth bass. So it's not that these fish are any more difficult than largemouth bass, it's always susceptible, in, at least in, in the lab. Okay, snakehead conductivity, uh, basically what we do is we change water conductivity and look at some, uh, some uh, mobilization response, and we plot that. Those are thresholds for mobilization across different water conductivities. We fit a curve to it, and part of that curve fitting means we have to uh, estimate uh, fish conductivity. So for snakeheads, it came out about 81 microsiemens per centimeter. Okay, so um, in the field, then this is the uh, field map for electric field for a boat. And, it, and the x-axis goes from uh, basically close to the anode, away from the anode on a vector, and those are voltage gradients. So the, you see the field drops off pretty dramatically, and, uh, w but we can fit that. And by fitting that, that allows us also to uh, standardize fields. Uh, here are the three waveforms that we tested in the field. Now, we used a GPP 
uh, unit. So this is not a great match to those waveforms we used in the lab. Do you notice one thing, they're rounded, they're not square, that, and, they, and fish react differently to rounded versus square waves. And secondly, uh, like we couldn't quite, the GPP does not allow you uh, great control, so we couldn't get a 30 pulse per second, 24% duty, we could get a 13% duty, so we went with that. The AC waveform is a much higher duty cycle, 44%. So anyway, it wasn't a great match, but we still got a lot of great, good information out of it. Okay, so our field trips were all in the same place. There are three of them, Pamunkey Creek, um, we uh, went out in November. Also, between those three trips, we went out over about seven months, three, those three trips over about seven months, and the water connectivities were close to the same, but the physical habitat differed. So uh, we, we trialed the 30 pulse per second and, and AC 60 hertz uh, to get threshold settings, and then we used the traditional uh, pulse direct current, 120 pulses per second, 36% duty was trialed for fish reaction but not threshold necessarily. So these are the results. Um, we didn't capture very many snakeheads on this trip. We only captured about two. So we had to kind of look at the whole community and how the whole community was reacting because snakeheads we didn't feel like were gonna be any different than what we were seeing out there. So those are the, for uh, the 30 pulse per second and the AC, those are the volts and amps threshold and the, and the power threshold for successful electrofishing. So 23 amps uh, for uh, 30 pulse per second and 19 for uh, 60 hertz. And then you see down at the bottom, we, you, there's the traditional 120 pulse per second. And it seemed a little low, so I was quite qu questioning whether that was actually uh, at threshold. Uh, maybe that was below threshold, but... Uh, We'll see. Here's where uh, immobilization thresholds and taxes thresholds occurred in the field. So for the 30 pulse per second, 13% duty cycle, which we did get taxes on traction, uh, the taxes threshold was 209 centimeters out from the anode, and the immobilization <coughs> threshold for a snakehead was about 164 uh, centimeters out. For AC, there's no attraction, so 123, and then for the pulse direct current 120 pulses per second, about 144 uh, centimeters distant for, to that immobilization. Th so think of that in a way as an effective field size for successful electric fishing. All right, so the, the, the next trips, again, we went out to Pomonkey Creek. The connectivity is about the same, but here was the difference. The, in, in December, the channel was deeper and we had submerged and emergent vegetation. In, in uh, six months later, same location, nearly the same water conductivity, but the, but the channel was shallow, narrow, and no emergent vegetation with low tide. So here are the results. Um, catch per unit effort under two physical habitat conditions. And one thing you might note is that in the low water, look, look how the, the, the uh, catch rates were way higher in low water as opposed to uh, uh, that deeper water with emergent vegetation. Also notice that with the deeper water that the attraction, the waveform causing attraction has had the highest uh, catch rate. But in the shallow water, the, uh, at the immobilization waveforms had the highest catch rate. So it's almost like you change waveforms depending upon whether you need immobilization or whether you need attraction. Okay, so here's the application, a recommended waveform type frequency. So if the water's deeper with emergent vegetation, uh, use a continuous DC if you can, or 30 pulse per second uh, pulse direct current, 24% duty cycle. If you're using a GPP, then you want to put it 100% of range, 30 pulses per second, 100% of range, and that'll get you that 13% duty that we use. That's a ma you're maxing the machine out for that. Uh, if the water is shallow with no emergent vegetation, think about it, a, uh, a mobilization waveform, 120 pulses per second, 25 to 40% duty cycle, or an AC 60 hertz. If you're using a GPP, set that percent of range dial to 40 to 60% to achieve the duty cycle that you need. 
And uh, here is an actual table of uh, that uh, a current table. I feel pretty good about this table actually for sh um, sampling snakehead. So uh, you have a, c a conductivity for the site. You take the conductivity you go over, and those that's the amp goal that you want uh, to be uh, for, for guidance. And that and that is just a graphic of that table to the right. Um, so if you want to follow this up and these recommendations and determine what your settings need to be, uh, then you can download an app for your phone at off a great website called electrofishing.net. Please visit that. A tremendous amount of material there. Or you can go to the App Store and get the Smith Root Electrofishing Utilities app. They do the same thing. Smith Root's a little lot nicer looking, but they do the same thing. If you want to generate tables, so the other two, you download those on your phone. You don't need an internet connection in the field. You just get the um, water conductivity. You stick that in. It gives you the volts or the amps that you need to apply uh, for starting as a guide. If you want the whole table, then you can go to electrofishing.net under tools and get the Excel file that will do that. And then finally, just want to acknowledge these people. The top four uh, folks were in the field with a lot of field work, appreciate that and support. Uh, Eric Sakaris at the end, uh, uh, thank him for statistical conversations we had. And with that, that's the whole, whole story. See ya. Questions for Alan? A lot of information there, Alan, thank you. Yeah, well, <laughs> it is, it's a download. It's a any, any electrofishing questions you demand to ask? Yes. Well, if you want, if you wanted to extend those tables, you can to any uh, conductivity you can get electric to it. I just had a sheet that was that. But AC has an advantage because it has these amperage swings, and, and high conductivity means amperage. And so you, you, oftentimes AC is effective when pulse direct current is. So you can test out in the field by either, if you have the controls on your control box that you can follow those tables, then you can say, can I get that? If I can't get that on pulse DC, let's shoot to AC and see how that works. Or, or if you're on the field, you have a GPT and, you, and maybe you can't follow the tables exactly, then um, once you get to a point where you're saying, I'm not sampling well, switch it to AC. Yeah, switch it to AC if you're saying you're not doing well and, and uh, your catch rates may increase substantially. Well, that's a good question. In two ways, one will affect the conduct and the conductivity. Colder, colder water will will decrease conductivity. That sort of thing. But also, there's a that's another efficiency factor, right? How these fish react. Um, Jonathan, you might you have a lot more experience than that. Maybe you can answer that. Well, there's obviously a lot more global. Thank you very much, Alan. <coughs> I, I guess the one thought I had listening to that adjusting in the field where if you're using catch per unit effort as a long-term metric for monitoring abundance, um, I'm not sure, you know, how much we're going to monkey with our settings when we've got 15 years of data with one setting, but I guess that's a talk for a lit another time. But thank you very much, Alan. Very helpful information. <coughs> Uh, next, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Annette Tagawa from Hawaii. And um, amazingly enough, I spoke with this woman in 2004 when snakeheads were first discovered in the tidal Potomac, and I was frantically calling around to everybody I could contact to find out, you know, to talk to somebody that actually had some experience with snakeheads. And after I went through probably 
five or six different layers to get to her, the actual person that worked in that district where they had snake kids in Hawaii. And after I asked her a bunch of questions, I remember like it was yesterday, I said, are there any problems with snake heads in Hawaii? And you, you gave me an answer and she said, yes. You said, yes, there is one problem. And I, and I said, oh, here it is. This is, this is Nirvana. This is a, the money question. What are the problems? And she said, we don't have enough. Thank you. Um, my name is Annette Tagawa. I'm an aquatic biologist with the State Department of Land and Natural Resources Division of Aquatic Resources. Um, I have a slight cold, so if my voice gets froggy or if I have a coughing fit, please bear with me. And I'm also technologically challenged, so I'm assuming this is the is the forward button. Anyway, my presentation is on the history of snakeheads, Chana maculata and Chana striata in the Hawaiian Islands. The history of snakeheads in Hawaii began in the 1800s with Chinese immigrants who came in as laborers for the sugar plantations on the island of Oahu. They brought the snakehead with them to Hawaii as a familiar source of food from their home country and raised them in their rice paddy fields and taro fields. Subsequently, they were also introduced into ponds and irrigation ditches as well. Locally known as pongi, these are highly desirable food fish, not only among the Chinese, but also among freshwater fishermen. Specimens collected in the early 1900s were misidentified as the chevron snakehead, Chana striata. These specimens are among those collected from Oahu in 1901 and deposited throughout various collections across the country. At home, it's in the Bishop Museum. It's also in the California Academy of Sciences and here at the Smithsonian Natural Museum History. I mean, hi Museum of Natural History, <laughs> excuse me. And they were all originally, I did the wrong thing. They were all originally labeled as Chana striata. This is the smaller of the two species. It measures about 200 millimeter standard length. The larger one measures at 280 millimeter standard length. Both of these specimens were obtained from a fish market in Honolulu. However, sea striata does exist in Hawaii, but it does so in captivity, occurring in only one aquaculture facility on Oahu. I know we're beating this thing to death, so bear with me. <laughs> in the early 2000s, when we heard stories about the snakeheads on the mainland walking on land, terrorizing people, and eating babies, I mean, we just had all kinds of things we heard. There was a flood of inquiries into our office asking if snake kids in Hawaii were just as dangerous. I remember our entire staff just looking at each other, scratching our heads, saying, gee, I was kind of lazy. So we <laughs> never encountered any of those problems here. Our species of snake head in Hawaii are what my son would call very chill, in that they don't move around very much or cause a lot of trouble. In fact, in captivity, they are known to sit on the bottom of the tank and would be happy to eat once a week and be fine with that. Of course, we're not sure if they're laid back because they're a different species from the northern snakehead, but they are not an invasive problem in Hawaii. In fact, they are pretty hard to find nowadays. Since they are not as notorious in Hawaii as they may have been depicted in other areas of the US, we prefer to use the local term pongi rather than the term snakehead, which seems to cause a panic due to the publicity of this fish on the mainland. At one time, the area on Oahu, which had the most abundant population of pongi, is the Wahiwa Public Fishing Area, which is located in central Oahu. More commonly known as Lake Wilson, this reservoir is actually owned by Dole Food Company. By placing a dam at the base where the north and south forks of the Kaukonahua stream meet, this allowed Dole to collect water to be used for the irrigation of sugarcane and other crops. In 1957, the Dole Food Company, then known as the Wailua Agricultural Company, entered into a memorandum of agreement with the then known Territory of Hawaii to establish, maintain, manage, and operate the reservoir as a public fishing area and to allow the state to utilize the reservoir for the purposes of introducing, protecting, conserving and propagating freshwater fishes for sport fishing. There was a need to provide more freshwater sport fishing opportunities in Hawaii 
as the types of native freshwater species, namely gobies, and available freshwater habitats is extremely limited. At full capacity, Lake Wilson comprises approximately 300 acres of fishable waters. Species introduced into Lake Wilson include peacock bass, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, bluegill, channel catfish, oscars, Chinese catfish, tilapia, carp, and the pongi, channel maculata. Pongi weren't all that abundant to begin with, but a few would show up regularly on our monthly creel surveys. There were also reports of illegal fishermen regularly targeting them as the pungi is a highly desirable food fish. Even today at the local Chinatown market, it commands a price of about $25 per pound. Over the years, they would be showing up less and less on our creel surveys with the last recorded catch being in 2007. Since then, they have not shown up at all on our creel surveys. However, one was spotted along the banks in Lake Wilson estimated to be about two feet in length in April of this year. Combing through our creel data for Waihua Reservoir, I found a sample set of what was typically observed of the Pongi population back in the late 80s. In the second half of 1988, 11 out of 289 fish surveyed were Pongi. Almost 30 years later in 2017, there were no Pongi recorded for the 2017 creel data. This doesn't mean that they are completely gone from the reservoir, as evidenced by the one observed in April of 2018, but their numbers are most definitely not quite what they used to be. Of course, having a lake full of introduced freshwater sport fish opens the door for a lot of unintentional introductions that may or may not have possibly affected the Pongi population in Lake Wilson. Lake Wilson has suffered a number of unintentional introductions a few of which have become established. During the 80s and 90s, Hawaii experienced a wave of unintentional or accidental introductions with the majority originating from the freshwater aquarium fish trade. We have seen many species come and go on the lake, but the ones that became established are the armored catfish, Pteragopithes multiradiatus in 1986, the freshwater stickfish, Xenentodon cancilla in 1988, and the red devil, Amphilophus citronellum in 1991, all of which are associated with the aquarium fish trade. The armored catfish first appeared in the lake in 1986 and quickly increased in abundance. This species didn't seem to affect the Pongi population, which had experienced an increase in abundance in 1988, where several adults appeared to have congenital deformations that were characteristic of a large recruitment. The bar portion of the graph represents the amount of snakeheads that we saw. When the stickfish made its appearance in 1988, and the stickfish I think is represented by the dark black line, um, these also increased in abundance, but decreased in numbers in the 1990s. The stickfish is a piscivorous species, but it is not an especially aggressive predator. In 1989, ingested pongi fry was found in one stickfish specimen suggesting these fish target torpedo-shaped fish, such as the young of the bass and the pongi. This potentially placed the bass and pongi populations in jeopardy since their young are torpedo-shaped and they utilize the same near-surface shoreline cover of California grass that is also occupied by the stickfish. In 1991, the red devil made its appearance in the lake, quickly occupying almost every niche it could find in the reservoir and the red devil is represented by the yellow line that's going upward. These fish will feed on small fish, as well as insect larvae, worms, and other bottom-dwelling organisms. Quickly increasing in abundance, they are today one of the most dominant species in the lake. Gut content has not been examined for the red devil, but it's possible that they could prey on the pungi as well. Another factor that may have contributed to the decrease in population of the snakehead is the lowering of the water level from an 80-foot maximum to a lower level of 60 to 65 feet in 2009. Dam safety standards were upgraded, and the dam in Lake Wilson was no longer considered safe to accommodate what is considered a probable maximum flood, which represents the 100-year flood in Hawaii. In order to accommodate a probable maximum flood or PMF event, the dam needs to be raised five feet in height. 
This would have cost in the millions of dollars for the old food company to do. So a compromise was reached where it, if the water level could be kept at 60 to 65 feet, the dam could accommodate at least half of a PMF event. Unfortunately, at the 60 to 65 foot level, the California grass will not reach the water, reducing the shoreline habitat for the Pongi. The last known Pongi recorded on a creel survey was in 2007. Since the early 2000s, the Pongi have been reported as very few and far between. Every so often, we may hear of a straggler or two after the occurrence of a heavy rain within the vicinity of areas that were once rice paddy or taro fields, providing evidence that they are still present in our local environment. At one time, the island of Kauai was included in the Hawaiian range for Pongi, but our Kauai biologist states that to his knowledge, there are no Pongi on Kauai. However, in October 2017, this Pongi was reportedly caught in Waikomo stream, which partially drains a reservoir on the island of Kauai. The person who caught this fish called our Kauai office wondering what this fish was. The fish wasn't in very good shape with bulging eyes that suggest some kind of parasitic infection. It was tentatively identified as C. striata by those who are familiar with this species, but unfortunately, the specimen was buried after these photos were taken, so we cannot confirm the species identification. There is most likely an established population of Pongi in this area, as fishermen since the 70s have reportedly taken Pongi on Kauai. More than likely, the Pongi were introduced on Kauai at approximately the same time as those on Oahu. It would not be out of the question that Chinese immigrants went to Kauai also in the late 1800s as well to work on the sugarcane plantations there too. We are working with local fishermen on Kauai to see if they can capture another specimen for us for confirmation as the fisherman who caught this fish said that he has seen more in the same location where he caught the original one. In conclusion, we can confirm that there are at least two species of Pongi in Hawaii and a possible third species if the one on Kauai ends up being another species. C. maculata is confirmed as being the species that was originally introduced to Hawaii, while C. striata was imported and presently occurring only within one aquaculture facility on Oahu. The recent specimen found on Kauai is questionable with regard to its species identification. It can be con if, it, if it can be confirmed that the species on Kauai is C. striata, then it's possible that both species may have been introduced to Hawaii by the Chinese immigrants, especially since both species originate from the same geographical area. So far, none of the species of Pongi in Hawaii appear to be problematic or invasive at this time. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll try my best to answer them as I'm no snakehead expert. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, not right now, no, no. Um, I guess they haven't really thought of it. There's other things that are a priority and we're short staffed. Um, maybe at one point it's possible to pretty much bomb Lake Wilson <laughs> with Rotano and then start over, but that would be an <laughs> overly massive fish kill that I don't want to deal with. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. No, not that we know of. Um, I was told the California grass, it used to reach the water level when it was 80 feet, but when the water level went down, it needs some moisture for it to follow. They just drain the water right away and there's no way for the grass to go in. Uh, with 300 acres, I don't know what kind of grass <laughs> we can plant, to be honest. Thank you. I think I dropped something. Is this mine? Um, this piece of paper. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Great. Well, we're going to stay in the uh, the Pacific Theater now. We're going to talk. Uh, have a talk with Katsuki Nakai about uh, snakeheads in Lake Biwa, Japan. And this gentleman I did not speak with in 2004, but I spoke with one of his peers at the Lake Biwa Museum, um, Gregor, I believe was his name, who's now re forced mandatory retirement in Japan. So uh, Katsuki has taken his place, but welcome. I'm glad you, and by the way, this gentleman was out with uh, Hey Kim last night and Jason Emmel bow fishing. So uh, he, he's a true wild man and we're, we're absolutely glad you made the trip. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, very kind introduction. And uh, delayed flight, changed flight, and uh, lost baggage, and overbooked hotel. <laughs> I felt as if I were almost rejected to attend at this <laughs> symposium. But fortunately enough, I could attend at the just at the beginning of this uh, very stimulative and <laughs> informative conference. And uh, I, was, I am so much impressed to hear many, many uh, uh, to hear there are so many kinds of uh, field and laboratory research on snakeheads in the US. But in Japan, there have almost no accumulation of this kind of research because uh, we did not experience so much invasive effect. Uh, we, rec we could not recognize so much invasive uh, impacts by this species. And instead, we have been suffering from very serious uh, invasive impacts by other fish from North America, largemouth bass and brogel and so on. So uh, from now, I will tell you only the uh, uh, historical story uh, and uh, almost including in no actual scientific data. At first, I, will apologize, I apologize about it. So uh, I, at first, a uh, uh, brief introduction to Lake Biwa. Lake Biwa is the largest and much, much smaller than your many giant lakes, but by far the oldest lake even among your lakes, because Lake Biwa is one of the ancient lakes of the world, uh, more than one million years old. And oh, and, and Lake Biwa has been suffering from very serious impacts by two major invasive animals and uh, two uh, invasive uh, organisms. One is invasive. Uh, predatory fishes from North America, large mouth bass and bluegill, and the other one is invasive amphibious plants from South America. So, uh, but you know, our resources are so much limited, so we need to concentrate our efforts. So, uh, you know, in this sense, uh, we are not, uh, uh, we are diff uh, it is very difficult for us to consider the uh, imp uh, to consider the uh, ecological impacts of uh, snakeheads in Japan right now and uh, we have uh, uh, northern snakehead in Japan and now it's, uh, it has established nationwide distribution and uh, this fish was introduced in the 1920s from Korean Peninsula and before that, we introduced uh, blotched snakehead channel maculata from Taiwan Island. And uh, this species has very rather re restricted distribution in Japan, almost uh, biased to the western part of Japan. And finally, rather new species, uh, <coughs> China Asiatica from Taiwan as well, uh, introduced in 19 around 1960. But this species was has almost very, very restricted to only a few localities all over Japan. And so I will concentrate my talk only two major snake heads, blotched, blotched uh, snake heads from Taiwan and established in the western part of Japan, 
Japan, uh, West Africa's population is only western part of Japan, and Northern Snakehead established from uh, imported from Korean Peninsula later, and established uh, almost nationwide distribution in Japan. At first, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, tell you the confused, confused taxonomical treatment, because uh, Dutch snakehead uh, formal, uh, was first introduced from Taiwan, and uh, is called Taiwan dojo or Taiwanese loach or laigyo, thunderfish in, ja in Japanese, and thereafter northern snakehead was followed. So. Northern snakehead was also called the similar name Raigyo, or a uh, very strange name, Kamuruchi, not Japanese word, uh, Korean original word. So uh, Taiwan Dojo is also, uh, and also Taiwan Dojo is also the Japanese name for Chinese uh, collectively. So two snakeheads have been collectively called as Taiwan Dojo or Raigyo. So the information was so much confused uh, and, and due to the prevalence of China Argos uh, northern snakehead, most snakeheads might have been identified automatically as northern snakehead in the previous distribution records without careful species identification. So uh, some of the uh, records may be uh, the misidentification of China maculata. Okay. <coughs> and this is a social treatment of snakeheads. After introduction of northern snakehead following blotch snakehead, their intentional release to other water bodies were prohibited officially because of higher, uh, because of uh, because they are alien piscivores, uh, piscivores. So, uh, by the inland fisheries regulations, the introduction was officially uh, become illegal. However, this regulation was not effective to stop expansion of their distribution within Japan. And owing to their unique names, mm, Taiwanese or Korean world, Korean world, snakeheads became well-known alien fish in, among Japanese people. But snakeheads had been the only warm water predators among alien fish in Japan and recognized as Rather familiar alien fish. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. And this is the uh, child uh, book for children, and the main character was uh, uh, Chan August. Okay. Uh, they are uh, playing with uh, native small prey fish. <laughs> okay. So uh, because they appeared to coexist peacefully with other native fish, native prey fish. And uh, this kind of experience to accept snakeheads without serious ecological impact may be one of the basis for carelessness to allow the active intentional introduction later of the predatory fish like largemouth bass and the bluegill in Japan in the 1970s because both are alien species. Both are fish-eating species. But uh, snakeheads did not cause serious impact. So probably largemouth bass and bluegill may be the same. But that was great misunderstanding for us. And this is the personal evaluation. <laughs> because of their ambushing habit, snakeheads are usually floating still near the water side, like logs, okay? This behavior will facilitate to be found in the field, and probably uh, this will be related to the overestimation of the abundance. So there are so many snakeheads, because most of all the individuals can be seen at once, for example. And in many irrigation ponds with snakeheads, small size cyprinid fishes were abundantly captured by traps. There have been very little or fragmental information of their negative impacts on native fish in spite of their frequent coexistence within ponds. And similar impression or evaluation of their invasiveness, or uh, very small invasiveness, uh, are shared among ecologists and ecologists. 
in similar or older generations among us. So probably uh, this species may not so invasive in Japan. And uh, instead, uh, invasion by North American predatory fish like largemouth bass and bluegill from nine, uh, it, the uh, dis distribution expansion started around the 1970s through 1980s. And uh, this is the distribu distribution pattern of largemouth bass and bluegill showed also similar, uh, al almost similar tendency. So uh, in the end of the last century, both species has almost nationwide distribution. And uh, mostly uh, they expand mostly through intentional introductions in parallel with the growing popularity for new type of fishing, that is lure fishing targeting largemouth bass. So largemouth bass was the main introduced as the main target, and bluegill may be the bait for largemouth bass, okay? And, uh, but you know, uh, non-native species uh, ha having the, uh, showing the invasiveness uh, became problem problematic in Japan as well. Most are from North American species, but some others are from European or Southeast Asia and so on. And not a few alien species, are, alien species have become so invasive as to require, require new regulations in addition to the extant regulatory legal systems. In addition, the prohibition of intentional introductions of largemouth bass and smallmouth bass by local fisheries regulations was not effectively stopped the illegal expansions. So uh, legal regulation of invasive species was made in addition to extant plant quarantine and animal quarantine. That is, Invasive Area Species Act in 2005. This act designates invasive area species, and uh, this act prohibits the intentional introduction to the world, importing, keeping, and transporting of live individuals with high penalties. And Fishes designated as invasive alien species are like, the, like them, okay? Largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, bluegill, channel catfish, and gambusia, mosquito fish. <laughs> All are from North America. Oh, and also, oh, you know, uh, five, oh, only five fish was the, uh, 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 among 26 uh, selected as IAS. Only five species have established. And uh, the other species were precautionarily selected as IAS. And none of the three snakeheads were not selected as IAS. And in Japan, our freshwater habitats are mostly Americanized. And largemouth bass and bluegill have been actively controlled and eradicated to recover our original ecosystem. But there have been not a few cases in which red swamp crayfish, another American, <laughs> explosively increased and destroyed aquatic vegetation. This is another problem. And this is, I will introduce the case of a, a small lake, Izunuma. Northern snakehead was introduced long before and had been coexisting with native fishes. And thereafter, largemouth bass started to sudden increase in 1996. And northern snakehead were declined together with many native fishes. And uh, the eradication efforts for largemouth bass has been started for these 20 years. While the, uh, they decided not to catch or remove northern snakehead. Then, red swamp crayfish seriously increased in the lake. But in a satellite small pond, where the density of northern snakehead is high, the density of large uh, no, red swamp crayfish has been suppressed at low level, probably uh, due to the predation pressure by northern snakehead. And this is a uh, oh, very rare actual scientific study by the postgraduate student, uh, Mr. Sato. 
Uh, Mr. Sato carried out ecological study on northern snakehead in Japan in Shizuoka Prefecture. In his study sites, most dominant prey was red swamp crayfish, occupying more about or more than 60%. And tadpoles became most dominant in autumn in, in some cases. And he concluded that northern snakehead preyed upon any animal they, con they encountered but selected less mobile animals like uh, crayfish or tadpoles more, su more successfully. And he also recognized two peaks of reproduction or breeding, habit breeding activities in warm seasons. And uh, all of the results was not yet published. And this is uh, the other example of natural small lake in Kyoto. Northern snakehead was introduced long before and had been coexisting with native fishes. Similar story like Izunuma. And like we, uh, largemouth bass started sudden increase in the 1970s, a little bit earlier. And northern snakehead were declined together with many native fishes. Similar story. Okay? But uh, from now, uh, this, the next part is different. Largemouth bass and bluegill have uh, been actively removed for these 20 years. Well, they decided not to catch northern snakehead. Finally, they expected northern snakehead to control the bullfrog population for the purpose to keep a moderate population level of red swamp crayfish because a red swamp crayfish may control or prevent overgrowth of aquatic plants there. So oh, that situation may be very, very complicated. And we need to re-examine previous distribution records because, uh, 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 as I told you earlier, in Japan, these two fishes are confused for a long time. And recent survey in Osaka Prefecture has found both snakeheads coexisting in the same river. And sometimes in other prefecture, we have the record of hybridization between two species. So there are possibilities that previous records as Kamuruchi or Northern Snakehead from all over Japan might include the cases of misidentification of blotched uh, snakehead. Who's so uh, the, blotched, uh, the distribution records of blotched uh, snakehead may be uh, underestimated. <coughs> uh, this is a tentative conclusion. Northern he snakehead is not so ecologically invasive, at least in Japan, like in Hawaii. This may be attributable to the evolutionary coexistence of the Japanese fauna with snakeheads as a part of the Eastern, East Asian fish fauna, probably. For the ecosystem management, northern snakehead may be useful for controlling the other invasive alien species such as red swamp crayfish and bullfrog. This is our tentative conclusion. So thank you very much for your attention. And I I'm appreciate very much to have uh, questions. But please give me questions in plain words slowly, <laughs> please. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, oh, around uh, oh, 1.2 meters at maximum. But uh, broached one, broached snake head is much smaller, about 60 centimeters only. Yeah. So yeah. Mm. Um, in terms of the eradication mm. of yeah. have you seen any change in the snakehead population? Have you seen that yeah. abundance Yeah. Right. Uh, you're right. Uh, in, in the first case, uh, snakehead population is gradually increasing. Mm. And in some isolated uh, pond, uh, the uh, density become very high and to su uh, high enough to suppress the population of crayfish. Okay. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Any other questions? Got it. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And our last technical presentation of the symposium falls to Donald Orth from Virginia Tech. And I think it would be a perfect segue um, into our panel discussion slightly later. I know you all are filling out your questionnaires with. Write your questions on the. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you all for being here. This has been a fascinating uh, symposium. I encourage uh, the organizers to start planning the second International Snakehead Symposium. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm here. I'm a fraud. Uh, I know nothing about snakeheads. Uh, I'm on speaking to a group of snakehead experts. Um, so it's not a technical talk really at all. It's really about uh, how we do planning, how we do management planning, and how we adapt those principles and rules to the snakehead wherever it is. Um, and you know, I gave the, I gave John this abstract with this opaque title because I, then I could pretty much talk about anything because you can't tell what I'm going to talk about based on the title alone. But um, just imagine that uh, Socrates, you know, our first moral philosopher, would would come back to life here and appear on the banks of the Potomac River, and uh, then he would start asking questions as he did. Uh, what is the right thing to do with regard to this? Uh, species in the Potomac River, in the Chesapeake Bay region, uh, elsewhere. And so Socrates practiced e ethics. He was the first moral philosopher, but he never wrote anything down. He practiced things by asking questions, and so that's what we'll do today. We'll organize this talk as a series of uh, questions. And then going back to Greece, which to my knowledge does not have northern snakeheads, um, uh, Pan Pandora was the first uh, woman created by the Greek gods, and Pandora was given a special gift by Zeus. And Zeus said, here is this box, special box. And of course, she was warned, do not open the box. And of course, she opened the box. And when she did, uh, you know, all manner of things um, blacked out. Uh, all manner of uh, evils you know, were you know, uh, put upon the, the world. You know, so she was the first evil woman in mythology uh, because she created all these bad things. So, you know, Zeus had this all figured out. So he was going to blame everything bad in the future on women and Pandora in particular. And so she really quickly closed the box and, you know, the only thing left in the bottom of the box was, was hope. And so my message here with using this, this is that it's a, it's a metaphor for the snakehead. When we start asking questions about the snakehead, a lot of shit's going to hit the fan, all right? And when we start having a panel discussion, people are going to get nasty. Their, you know, their evils will come out. So that's, you know, that's what we've got to be ready for. Um, by the end of the talk, though, I hope there'll, there'll be a little slim you know, sliver of hope uh, if you'll stay awake. So here's the Socrates uh, going to ask me questions. You know, first, what is this talk really about? Um, so I begin by um, describing what I think is success. We're all fisheries biologists and managers. What is a successful management program? What does it take? And uh, so I examine a lot of things, frameworks I think will be ho helpful for us to use in our planning attempts, things like um, uh, value theory, ethical pragmatism, cognitive hierarchy theory, uh, trust theory, and adaptive management. These are things we can use to guide our future management and uh, talk more about these things in the second international symposium. I will not focus on the question about whether or not northern snakehead uh, threatens the natural environment or, or the economy. We'll leave that to the panel discussion. So uh, Socrates, you know, next question here is, uh, after what's this talk about, uh, is like, what is success? You know, I need to know. You know, and this is really, these are important lessons that I've been teaching over 38 years to enthusiastic uh, undergraduate fisheries majors. And, you know, if, if you haven't done this 
you know, I just have to tell you, it's like, it's like holding on to a slimy American eel long enough to kind of impart some wisdom into their, their ears, you know, it's like you know, growth mortality management intervention, blah, 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 really, blah, blah, blah. no, 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 and you know, there's Jason and Patrick and Hay, and you know, you know what I'm talking about. They, they are not going to get this message, and so you probably haven't gotten it either, but what is success? We're all technically competent biologists. I know you are, but success in a management context requires these things, three Ps and TSO, passion, persistence, partnerships, which require trust, and strategic optimism. Any one of these things is missing, and we're a depressed body of fisheries managers trying to do our job. So I'll come back to this a little bit, but uh, Socrates is going to keep me on schedule by asking other questions about ethics. You know, ethics, where do they come from? Why do I need to consider an ethical framework? And so this is the framework. This is cognitive hierarchical theory, and it starts with values. Our values with regard to the northern snakehead have not changed since 2002. Your values are the same as they were back then. So those values are stable. There's a few things that transcend context, space, and time. Excuse me, getting ahead of myself. Uh, but those values determine how we look at risk and how we evaluate risk and talk about risk. And it determines our attitudes, how we will think about this species and the behaviors. Now the behaviors, this all drives from your values and attitudes. However, when we get down to behaviors, now there's more numerous things we're talking about. These are faster to change, and managers can manipulate behavior by being wise psychologists, or if you have to, invoke policy and legal changes. But then you have to get in the policy making arena. So we'll talk about that as well. So, Socrates, wow, <laughs> since you were around asking questions, we have encoded a lot of these theories into these various words. This is a whole course in ethical frameworks, ethical theories. Some of those words may look familiar to you, others may not. But the fact is, when you're dealing with management, you're dealing with an inclusive body of the publics, all of which are starting with values in these different quadrants, what's most important to them. So you ha we all have to be amateur ethicists, even though we're like, I want to just handle the fish and I don't want to deal with people. Um, and uh, Stephen Keller developed a series of value types in the 90s. A lot of studies have uh, been done since that. These are some of these crazy words they end with isms or istics and, and the like. But um, to, to make this real, you know, not everyone is going to value smoked snakehead, you know, or any hors d'oeuvres made with snakehead. You know, we learned last night that they go pretty good with bourbon and beer and wine. I mean, but we're, but we're a, a very non-random sample of the people out there. Uh, and so th these, all of these types of uh, people are the ones we have to deal with. They don't necessarily think like us. So depending on their value system, if they're consequentialists, the utilitarianists, that's their ethic. Well, they're going to live by certain principles, principles of the greatest good. And so their position with regard to something like the snakehead was like, yes, do everything we can to incentivize bow fishing, right? We're all for that. We're going to get behind that, and that'll solve our problem. The problem is not everybody believes this way, and they are not going to be in the same boat. So we can think about someone who's uh, a virtue theory theorist, and that theory posits then, I'll follow the principle of care. And so I'll, my position is no kill. I mean, I don't, I don't want to see dead animals. I care if they are snakeheads. So let's go, let's try to get to the science here. Socrates says, uh, what do the scientists say? And uh, scientists have said a lot about invasive species work. Uh, a recent survey that was published in 2014 tried to survey all of the literature on invasive species. Some of these were papers on invasive uh, and uh, northern snakehead that people in the audience have written. 
And in the last 10 years, this has just gone, you know, 14,000 individual papers on invasive species. We should know a lot, and we do know a lot globally. Now, of that, publications that dealt with invasive species that included a social dimension to the study, you know, almost didn't exist 10 years ago, and have been very, very few. And if I look at what we've discussed in the last day or two, no, we're not talking about people, we're not talking about social dimensions, we're talking about just how much rotenone does it take and uh, what is it going to take to reduce the abundance by 82 percent. So the studies that have been done all over the world on invasive species that have looked at the social dimensions have identified values conflict and, and lack of institutional trust as primary take-home messages. Do we have that in your region, my region? You know, we don't know because we haven't necessarily evaluated those questions. So science does inform policy. We have to have all this uh, technical science, but we also have to have the human dimension side built in there. So, you know, people have said that, you know, making policy is like making sausage. You know, and that's a lot of bullshit. I mean, I've made sausage, kielbasa, other, you know, I mean, it's an orderly process, you know, and there's certain things. There's a recipe, it goes in the tube, and it comes out, and it should all be the same. Policy making, those of you who've had the pleasure of doing it, realize that, no, it's not that easy. So we're going to make a policy and a rule about northern snakehead, and, and you happen to be in Maryland or in Virginia, lucky you. I mean, it's not a fun thing to do. All right, you got to deal with people, you know, who are not the same as the fish biologist in your uh, local uh, group. So you're going to deal with people who are angry and, you know, quickly find that they don't trust you or your agency or your predecessor. They have a history to tell you. So uh, the science about invasive species tells us with certainty that conflict is inevitable. And so it's predictable that the way we assess risks are going to differ from person to person, and it's going to result in conflict. And so we got to walk into this thinking like we're in conflict mode. This is how we're working. It's not all going to be pleasant. And so conflicts are based on values. So I put up just a few sample values here that I thought you could relate to. We have utilitarian values. We have moralistic values, humanistic values, negative, t t negativistic values about wildlife. And that, you know, in a, in a population included in decision making, you know, there's going to be disagreement. There, there, that's, that is predictable. So my point is, not that it's going to be easy, but that as going forward in developing good rules and good plans or better plans, we have to embrace this diversity of value systems. And that means none of these ethical frameworks that I have discussed so far are what I'm recommending will work. All of them will create problems. And the only useful ethical framework for this is what I call ethical pragmatism. And here's the pragmatic osprey, you know, it doesn't care if it's a non-native fish, I, I mean, it's food. All right. But ethical pragmatism engages the whole community with both questions of fact and science and questions of values and recognizes what we're doing here is problem solving. And let's all work on getting the words right for how we perceive the problem, how we describe the problem. You know, and you don't have to go back too many years, 2002, Crofton, Maryland, to realize how things got out of control in such a hurry. I mean, what a, again, I'm not, I can't possibly blame anyone who was here at the time, but remember the history and the context. 9-11, 2001, <laughs> I mean, Enron, WorldCom, all sorts of creepy things were happening. All, and the snake had appeared in a pond in Maryland. All of a sudden, these journalists said, Oh, let me get out of here. I mean, I've got to go write a story about something fun, like Snakehead. And they did. They were journalists. They were interesting stories and headlines. And, like, and, and unfortunately, office fish biologists kind of got stuck on the phone 
you know, 24-7 answering questions and making up stories about the snakehead, the fact that they would eat everything in a pond and move across land. And, you know, so it, we started the problem right then. And there's no going back. There's no going back. So, at, at the, okay, thank you, Socrates, for keeping me on track. Yeah, is it a conflict species? Yeah, unfortunately it is. Doesn't sound like it is in Hawaii or Japan, but it is here, and that, that's the way we define problems. We think about the actual type of problem and then the perception of the problems. And if people think that uh, it's a tame problem, it's easy to fix, um, but it's actually a wicked problem, then you know anything we do is going to fail. Different way of thinking is going to be needed. And so we have to approach this thing. It, it's a wicked problem. I don't care where you're coming from. Let's approach it as a wicked problem. And our experience um, here, uh, and again, we had this repeatedly in uh, different talks, control methods are going to fail. Uh, three quarters of a million dollars of rote known and, and then it doesn't work. Uh, I mean, our track record is going to be bad here. So we have conflicts here. This slide, the idea natural is best is um, is an implicit assumption that is always made by many people, and, and it's what I call the naturalistic fallacy. Uh, and it leads us into troubles. If individuals believe that humans are separate from nature, and then this value and belief system naturally leads to the desire to act to preserve and protect nature. It's something that needs to be protected because it's special, regardless of the cost. So this is by definition, restoring nature means we gotta kill non-native fishes. So we're committing what the natu naturalistic fallacy in, in moral theory that something is natural, therefore it's morally acceptable. No, it's not that easy, okay? We gotta talk, oh God, you know, that's, <laughs> no, 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 I wanna be a fish biologist, I wanna squeeze fish, I'm gonna work eight hours in the field and go home and never have to deal with another human being. I mean, that was my goal, right? I'm sure some of you feel that way, uh, but it doesn't work that way. So I call this view nativism. I think Tim Campbell used that the other day, thank you. It's, you know, so I'm not making up these words. And it conflicts with a cosmopolitan view of, of life. So if we view humans as part of a nature that's in flux, you know, those, that's a cosmopolitan view, and these views will lead to a desire to kind of rehabilitate ecosystem uh, and non-native species. It's possible non-native species can actually perform similar functions in ecosystems as native species. Uh, so it may be, a, a, you know, na this non-native can be an addition, something to manage, not something to battle. So wor words are very important as we move forward, especially as we talk to other people um, who are not in our small little group of scientists. Um, our discourse reflects our values and communicates to the public about the nature of the problem. And when we get our problem taken over by people like John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and David Let Letterman, I mean, you know you're in trouble. Yeah, I mean, that's what happened in 2002 uh, with the snakehead. So is the northern snakehead a wicked problem. And you all have to make that judgment yourself, but, but I believe uh, the answer is yes, it's a wicked problem. And we'll discuss this further in the panel discussion. Uh, I so far in Virginia, we have uh, rules for authorized destruction of, of northern snakehead. Maryland has rules for compulsory destruction of uh, native uh, or northern snakehead. We have rules to prevent their uh, live uh, transportation and no matter um, you know, how many snakehead cakes and hors d'oeuvres we eat, the problem is going to be there. And so as we see the snakehead spreading and more people get involved, more states, yeah, this is a conflict species, this is a wicked problem, and it's, it's harder to solve because there's, it's more, more stakeholders and more people to deal with. Uh, so Socrates says, is there hope? Is there hope at all? And I think there is no hope for a silver bullet. You know, we, we all came to this meeting hoping for the silver bullet. No, it's not there. 
hope lies in learning uh, lessons from other uh, invasive species issues from around the world. And what works, again, is that rare combination of passion, persistence, partnerships, in trust with many partners, and developing a strategic optimism in our management plans. What doesn't work is what your boss always tells you to do, your dad. You go get a task force, decide, announce it, defend it. And, and, and what's worse than dad is DDAD, which is decide by this deadline and announce it and then defend it and live with that decision. This leads to pessimism and uh, the most, um, uh, well, let's not talk about the psychological effects, but I mean, th th you go home with this, you know, knowing that you got a plan, you're defending the plan, and it's not working. So Socrates, again, how do I develop trust? How do I develop pr trust? And there's a, this trust theory that's become more popular in the natural resources management literature. There are antecedents to trust. There's history that needs to be overcome before you build trust and then can have responses of all these parties to uh, the, the according to that trust. And actually some empirical studies have been done, different cases to look at what leads to trust. And this is, this is real statistics here, right? So this is the one place where I actually have some data. I didn't do this study, but they, they looked at various cases, you know, and look at the uh, tr uh, outcomes uh, of conflict and where you have the uh, parties believing that they're independent and they're involved and they have an influence on the decision that led to trust and that led to a better management plan and better conflict resolution. So there's hope. I believe there's hope. And uh, yes, Socrates wants to know what the truth is. It's like none of us know what the, what the really the truth is here. Um, the truth is um, we probably have to do something different. Okay, and that, that top panel kind of shows the way we typically ap approach science and science problem. You know, the science, oopsie, the scientists are over there. We got a problem. We take it to them. We negotiate a contract. In three months, they give us the answer. No, you may actually negotiate. It takes three months to negotiate the problem, you know, but it basically it's separate. And what we need to do is merge these entities so that the people, and there's so many people who care about Snakehead for different reasons, engage them in the process, help them do the science, help them answer the questions uh, so that we are being more efficient because n everyone knows who works in a state agency, you're not going to get any more money in your budget just because you have an in invasive northern snakehead. You know, that's just going to be a cost. It's a, a liability. It's not going to result in more revenues. And we need to start ranking the risk which means we have to define these impacts. I was hoping and waiting and trying to write down a quote. The impact the northern snake had in this place was X, defined by this. Uh, I may have missed it. But we have to begin using words and using uh, criteria and saying, is the impact minimal, massive, major, moderate? I, I just what is it? Uh, and, and then move on. Today, where are we? Uh, well, I, here's what I think, uh, based on what I kn little I know, uh, that we've gone through this period since 2005. Uh, we've polarized all our positions. Everyone knows what they believe and knows what needs to be done, uh, but we're not doing it. I think we developed a management uh, control plan. Fish and Wildlife Service announced it on the Federal Register in 2015, said you had 30 days to comment, uh, and, and three years later, I don't know what the hell's going on with the plan. Uh, so we've got to reduce conflict. We've got to approach this in a conflict resolution uh, mode. This task force decide, announce, defend. That's going to lead to this defense of pessimism. We need to be strategic. We need to be optimistic. We need to develop multiple criteria, multiple objectives here. What is the risk? How do we perceive it? How do we measure it? And consider the fact that the values of stakeholders are very different. And we're done. We're almost done here. So just a few, you know, comments uh, to leave you with. So uh, what I'm trying to do is get us to thinking about talking about what is the what is the reason? What is the, the, the theory of your ethical reasoning? Make it clear. Uh, and invasive species are not inherently good or bad. Largemouth bass are not not inherently good or bad. But you put them in the wrong place. Yeah, they're a bad fish. Your northern snakehead. 
you know, you put them in the new river, my backyard, that's a bad fish. All right, and, and, and but Ann, don't, I'm done, I'm done. Spectacular, Don, as advertised. Thank you very much. Right, your questions. I think we'll go ahead. I'm sure there are questions and, and uh, conversation that will arise out of Don's presentation, but I think that's perfect for our panel discussion. So if we could get everybody to come up forward real quick. I don't know how we're going to get everybody one picture shot, but Yvonne said we can do it. So if everybody come up front here, and we'll get a group picture, and then we'll go to a, a break for about 20, 